purchase can only be evaluated subjectively prior to purchase. <clears throat> you know, I've got to make judgments. I've got to say, yeah, I like, Leo likes dealing with Sony uh, because they, they have a friendly way in which they build the computer. Well, the computers tend to be better because of the co-creation experience, but that's just a subjective opinion in some sense that he might have heard from somebody else. It's only once we experience it that we can be a bit more confident. Whereas with the physical good, I can pick it up, as with the search product, pick it up, boot, boot it up, play with it, close it down, and, and know if it's any good or not. So, you know, if we think about, for example, a movie, how good was that service? Yes, it depends upon whether you like the movie. But if it's a bad movie, you're not necessarily dissatisfied. But it, it might be a, a, in fact, you might be delighted with the service experience. Equally, if it was a great movie, you could walk out extraordinarily dissatisfied with the service experience. The service employees might have treated you poorly or well. Um, other customers in the, in the, uh, the theatre were throwing, throwing Maltesers and left their phones on. You know, the movie could be great. But the service environment in which the movie is delivered um, was not so great. might even be what we call the condition of the service scape. You sit down on the chair and you stick to chewing gum. Oh, that's not good. Or it's got coke in the seat that someone's dripped and it soaks into your jeans. Or, you know, you see a cigarette butt out on the, on the chair itself. Speaking of which, uh, there was a great... Great story told to me by a former colleague about <clears throat> a company that went to pitch for the work of National Rail in the UK. Uh, in fact, it was Colin, you've met Colin, who told me this story. As he describes it, this company uh, wanted to pitch for the work. The National Rail uh, executives turned up to this company's office to hear the pitch. National Rail was, was in England, uh, known for being exceptionally poor in, in, in service, just as our V-Line is, terrible service generally, um, and they wanted to have a makeover. So the, the executives roll up to this office, they, they open up the, up the uh, elevator doors, walk into the office, there's a plant in the corner that's dead, it's brown, wilted, falling over. The office has got this musty smell, sort of stinks a little bit. Uh, they walk in and these, the receptionist is on the phone, smoking on the phone, talking to a friend. You know, yeah, get you soon. Yep, no. Nah. Yeah, Sharon. So anyway, how was the weekend? Great. Okay, brilliant. And finally hangs up, says, can I help you? And they say, well, we're here to see these people for the pitch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a seat. They go to take a seat, there's cigarette butts in the seats, there's chewing gum, as I've described, all over the seats. They're asked for a coffee, if they wanted a coffee, yep. Yeah. It comes cold, 10 minutes late, and in the wrong configurations that they asked for. Um, they, the, the executives wait for about half an hour to, a, to an hour. I've got the actual time. They say, this is ridiculous. Why are we even letting these guys pitch? They're hopeless. Up they get, walk to the lifts, and out of the, out of the fire escape pop the advertising agency executives, throw out their hands and say, welcome to British Rail. The, the, the pitch was the experience. This was what it's like to be a customer of British Rail. Awful. Cigarette butts on seats, chewing gum sticking to you, coffees that are cold, um, people, trains not running on time, people being rude to you, service staff ignoring your requests for help. That was what it was like to be a customer of British Rail, and that was a, quite a risky pitch idea, but obviously uh, resonated and they won the business. British Rail had probably thought that the reason people buy us is because they get from A to B. Yeah, that's part of it, but they want to get to it from A to B in a way that, that includes nice treatment from service providers, um, customers who are respectful of, of, of others, you know, a service gate you know, namely the conditions of the serviced environment that are um, amenable to, to, to a pleasurable ride. So <clears throat> this is 
Uh, this is incredibly important, and I think more and more these days, because we're starting as consumers to evaluate our retail environment. We're caring more. Well, maybe not more. We've always cared about the retail environment, but now we're, we're placing a premium on it. We like uh, enjoyable, authentic shopping experiences. And this is why I have no sympathy for Harvey Norman, is because while other stores are doing their best to improve their service scape, the context in which you buy products, Harvey thinks it's all about stacking them high and selling them cheap in a crappy service environment. I even read the other day that someone, someone bought a, a thumb drive from Harvey Norman, plugged it in, and it had someone else's photos on it. I mean, you know, just, just rubbish like that that you don't want to see in a retail environment. And customers are, are now becoming super critical of that aspect of the offering. So <clears throat> these um, other elements, these other elements of the service environment, these other intangible elements are what will drive customer perceptions of quality. Now, tangibility can vary from product to product. Obviously, um, something as, as simple as a, as a chemical, I'm always amazed that, you know, uh, when I say that the tangible is dominant with, with a product like salt, I mean, sodium chloride, how simple can you get? But already we're seeing ways in which salt, physical goods, can be delivered with a service. And it might be the retailer who's talking us through different kinds of salt. It might be a returns policy that we have on the box if you don't like your salt. You know, it could be a, an informational blurb when you take a photo of a, of a barcode on the salt package. All of these things are services. Yes, the core product is, is a chemical and it's at its simplest, but usually um, there are going to be other service elements uh, related to the product. Water, H2O, is a tangible product, but already the message on this Mount Franklin bottle is a message just for you, the McGrath Foundation. There's a barcode scanner. Has anyone got that on their phone? barcode scanner? No? No one in the room. You're all 17 with mobile phones coming out in the yin yang. No one's got a barcode scanner. Mm. Can you scan this? I want to know what it says. But is that something that's intangible, a service-related element to a physical good? Yeah. There you go. And of course, when we move down the line, we're starting to see service improve or as a, as a component of the offering increase. Buying a car comes with it a huge amount of service. Yes, the physical car, this $30,000 offering, is a, huge, is, a, is a large part of the value, but also we need to get the car serviced. We need um, roadside assist. We want minor repairs. We want, um, you know, we may value being invited to events, whatever. There's a service element to it. You know, restaurants, you're not even sure. Half the time, I'm never even sure whether I'm buying a physical good or a performance in a restaurant. Oftentimes, it's a bit of both. You know, airlines, what's physical about it? Nothing. You're just being moved from A to B. You're being moved. What's physical? The seat, yeah. The food, yes. But by and large, it's the moving of you from Melbourne to London that is the massive value you're purchasing. You know, broking, consulting, this is advice. Teaching even. <clears throat> Crikey, you guys, all you take away from this course is a textbook and a couple of notes on PowerPoint slides. Not much tangible. There's not much tangible about it, is there? And in fact, the value you get from this, this set of lectures, you may not even realise for five to ten years. You may not even realise for five to ten years. So anything, the, the value you get from this is it almost got nothing to do with the tangible aspects of it. Yes, you can touch me, but, but, but I'm, not the, I'm not the value. It's the words that come out, hopefully, are useful, and you can't touch them, can you? Can't touch that. <laughs> MC Hammer, you're not, that, you're not that young after all. So th this is very much an intangible product. Okay, the second problem. 
inseparability of production and consumption. How do we go? Is that the message? You get the code and oh. it sends you to a website. Oh. A bit boring. Oh, what does it send? What does it? Oh, forget it. <laughs> okay, thanks for trying. So there you go. Don't make things difficult. Ooh, you're worried that that was going <laughs> to. <coughs> Don't make things difficult for customers. That's an extra step. That's a step too far. Don't do it. It's, that's a promotion. All right, inseparability of production and consumption. Well, with a physical good, I mean, Mount Franklin can make this water. They can fill the bottle. They can sit it in a shelf, in a box, in a warehouse that, w that can be moved to a retailer. It can sit up in the professor's court cafe where I bought it for weeks or months, if you like. Um, it's produced, then sold, and now I'm consuming it. Services, on the other hand, tend to be first sold. You came to Melbourne University on a promise, a promise that this would be a fantastic degree. And it's shaping up that way, isn't it? It's been awesome so far. You don't look impressed. You've got a blood nose. Jeez, what happened? I didn't touch him. What are you saying? You're right? You, want to, you can head off. In fact, your blood nose is a great segue into this next point. That <laughs> Apologies for emphasising it, but uh, generally speaking, a service is sold first on a promise and then produced and consumed simultaneously. Again, we have to be in the same room together, you and me. Anna. Sarah. Margot. Margo. I can't get it right. Have I got even close this year? No, I haven't. Margot and I need to be in the same room next to each other for her to consume this service. but you don't really, do you? We're starting to work out ways in which we can start to separate that. We've got this lecture recorded. You can go back to this another time. I can provide you with this service remotely. We don't have to always be together. So the nature of service delivery in the past was very much around Margot and I needing to be in the same room. But we don't have to... Do that. that is becoming... Technology is enabling a separation of those services. ATMs probably the first example where we could separate the provision of the service of, you know, furnishing you with money, cash, from the, the, the need to have a person doing it, from the normal banking hours. You could do it outside of those hours. So this problem is starting to be whittled away as a problem by technology. But it's still absolutely incredibly important that when we are in that, that, that inseparable moment, when Margot and I are sitting next to one another, <clears throat> sharing ideas, that that format, that context is outstanding. It has to be outstanding. This is Jan Carlsen, who I think I've talked about already, former CEO of Scandinavian Air Services, who coined the term moments of truth. This was the story I was telling you. When, when Carlsen came to... SAS, he realised that a flight from Stockholm to London wasn't the two hours that the plane was in the air. The flight was about the 12 minutes where a service provider had contact with a customer. It was the time at the check-in that took a minute and a half. It was the time where your boarding card is scanned, which takes three seconds. It's the time where you're greeted as you come on the plane, that takes four seconds. It's the lunch that's served to you that takes 45 seconds. It's the, 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 the rubbish that's cleaned away, which takes 11 seconds. It's the, the greeting from the, the captain when the plane lands and you deplane that takes two seconds. Those are what he called moments of truth. Now, we have two hours together. That's okay, but think about this. In this entire course, one-eighth of your first year, all we get to spend together is 24 hours. That's not much. One eighth of a year of a degree which will propel you into superstardom in the commercial world or any industry for that matter, and we only get 24 hours together. It's not much. These are moments of truth. And that's why when I told off one of your colleagues the other day about talking is because we don't have that many moments. And I really want this to be the best experience it can be for you and me. So these moments I see as precious. Uh, they're fleeting, although 
at 25 to 2, I'm pretty sure you're not thinking that these moments are fleeting. Well, like, get me the hell out of here. All right, another problem is that services are inherently variable. Now, Leo and I, when we made the computer, I might have been in having a great day that day. I was, I'd slept well, got eight hours of sleep. I felt terrific. <clears throat> and he and I worked wonderfully well together. But next time Leo comes to buy a computer, I might not be there. It might be somebody else that's providing that service. And my colleague happens to be a bit of an idiot and he's treated Leo poorly. That's no good. Or when I'm working with Leo, another impatient customer comes in and, oh, by the way, the segue was that you can go home and listen to the lecture on, online. Okay. Yeah, okay. But your nose is stopped now. Yes. That's good. Good on you. Um, could be one customer or another. Could be that Margot is impatient and interrupts Leo or me with Leo creating that service. You know, another customer in that service scape can create some variability. It could even be me. I've had a great day working with Leo. The next time he comes to me, I've had a terrible day. I've slept three hours. I'm hungover. I'm, I'm, I'm angry with life. And we have a terrible experience. We all know that this can happen in our own experiences in service contexts. Somebody lets you down. One great encounter with a restaurant is terrible the next. And, and so on and so forth. So variability enters into services that at a greater degree than it does in physical goods. I mean, yes, I think I've bought a dud apple. People have often said, you've got a lot of problems with your apple, Simon. I think you bought what's known in the car industry as a Monday morning lemon. Don't buy a car that was made on Monday, and that, actually they also say Friday, because Monday people are pissed off about coming back to work and they don't take as much care or they're thinking on talking about their weekend and not focusing on rivets and bolts. Or Friday, they just want to get the hell out of there. So don't buy a Friday car, Monday morning car, or a Friday afternoon car. I probably bought a Monday, Monday morning laptop. Um, and it's because there is some variability in physical goods manufacturing, but not much. Not like people. Not like um, human interaction. That's much more of an issue. The third problem is, uh, oh, is this our final one? Is perishability. <clears throat> and this is the fundamental idea that we cannot inventory a service. Now, as I say, this is changing a little bit. This service is being inventoried as we speak, in some sense. My lecture is being recorded and will be put online for you within five minutes of it finishing. We're kind of getting closer to inventorying services, to storing up a service. But it's still not the same, is it? And one of our colleagues remember a couple of weeks ago when I asked, why would you turn up over a, over a Blacktopia recording? And she said something like, well, it's the interaction that you can have that's much better. It's much more effective face to face. We can ask questions. The guys listening to the recording can't hear your answers, for example, whereas you guys can hear each other. Um, so we're starting to inventory services a little bit, but it's not that easy. So while you might get fluctuations in demand, you get almost no fluctuations in supply. You can't chop the top three floors off a hotel in low season and then build them again for peak season. There are 400 rooms in this hotel every day of the year, irrespective of demand. Irrespective of demand, we've got 400 rooms to sell. Um, I'm sure hotels would love to have some sort of ability to grow inventory and shrink it, but you can't. This notion of perishability is very much intractable. In fact, this is where you see companies become very clever at what's known as yield management. Airlines are the best at this. We talked a bit about that in pricing, where we found out or discovered that airlines almost charge a different price for every seat they sell. Not quite that granular. But airlines, and I, and I asked you to do did anyone do that experiment? Ask the guy next to them what they paid for their seat. No one did it. I'd encourage you to do it one day. Just say, my idiot marketing lecturer told me to say this, what did you pay for your seat? And it will be different from your price. I'm fairly sure of that. 
But we do that because we want to match demand with supply. Supply's fixed. The plane's flying no matter what. 200 seats is going to Melbourne on this day at this time no matter what. Demand varies and we're trying to calibrate it so that we, we meet, uh, match supply with demand. <clears throat> so this is the issue of perishability. So how do we deal with these problems? Well, we've started to touch on some of the techniques. One way is to add physical evidence. You know, one thing's for sure about um, a intangible product is that unless we've got some evidence to sort of represent that intangible product, we're going to find it difficult to explain what it is that we received or even remember what it is that we received. So the physical evidence is that environment, it's these tangible offerings that provides that sort of physical reminder of what it is that we've actually received. And Leo, to be sure, at the end of our co-creation service experience, has a computer. And a computer that he wants, no less. So that's a nice, tangible, or physical piece of evidence. But <clears throat> you don't get a computer when you go to see your doctor. You get a performance, a diagnosis, an assessment. So what can the doctor do in terms of physical evidence? Well, this is where the doctor has degrees on the wall, um, the skeleton in the corner, you know, the eyeball, you know, the half an eyeball on the stick, on the desk, the white leather, the white jacket, the, you know, the stethoscope that he never uses, but it's there. These are the physical things that we grab hold of. You know, it's the books in the, in the lawyer's office. It's the, the leather desk sets. It's the banker's lamps. It's the degrees again on the wall. It's the, those sorts of things that are the physical reminder of what it is that we've bought. And yes, of course, it might be the, the di the, uh, some, some uh, evidence regarding the diagnosis or a document that's a contract that says, this is what you've, we've done for you. But by and large, it's a performance. So the tangible aspects that we add help the customer to make sense of that. I mean, do you need a credit card? A physical card to access credit services? Yes, no, no you don't. Yes, there are machines that demand you stick it in there. Those machines are irrelevant. Can you remember your mum's phone number? Can you remember your sister's phone number? Oh. Your brothers, your best friends. Okay. <laughs> oh God, mummy's boy. He's only got one phone number in there. Okay, you can remember two phone numbers. How many numbers is that? Sixteen. Or oh, as in digits. That's sixteen digits. How many digits on a credit card? Sixteen. Can we remember a credit card number? You bet we can. We don't need the physical card. I can log on to my internet banking with four friggin' digits, a PIN number on, on an app, four digits, and I can access all the money that I have, or not have, but I can do that. I don't need a card to access. I don't need physical evidence necessarily, or a physical, a tangible element, but why do we have cards? Because they are a reminder of the service. They are a status symbol. They, are, they do other things. Cards do other things. Uh, as a physical reminder of this service. Well, we know that variability matters and for, uh, uh, for the services, also the inseparability of production and consumption is people getting together. People, how do we manage our people is a hugely important part of managing services effectively. So the second additional P, one is physical evidence. The second is participants or people. These are the human actors, this is you, this is me, in the room where the service is being provided. When we ask retail customers what was their best retail experience, 73% of customers said it was down to this employee. It was this person. It wasn't the fact that I got in early or first or the store opening hours were longer or the product variety was awesome, 
or you know the, the returns policy was brilliant it wasn't anything to do with that it was a person who defined my best service experience in a retail context equally 81% of customers said that they attribute their worst retail experience to employees we're on a knife edge here this can go either way Employees in a service context are the service. They're everything. Oftentimes they're the worst paid, the most poorly treated, and receive the least training, least development. We've got to flip that around. As we normally think about organisations, and even when you study OB, they'll talk about organisational hierarchies and structure and control, all that sort of stuff. That at the top of the organisation is the CEO, he or she controls the managers who control the employee, the, senior, the junior managers, who control the guys going out delivering the service, the bank tellers, the, the, the kids on the counter at McDonald's, the, um, you know, the, the receptionist at, the, uh, uh, at, at the, the advertising agency, whatever, that these guys are being controlled. My argument is that it should be the other way around. I'm not saying that these guys control, rather those who are responsible for the perception of service quality are the ones that need the most support. If you're <coughs> saying that customers attribute two thirds of their best experiences to employees and more than two thirds of their worst to employees, how can we leave that to chance by employing by not taking any care over how we employ people, by paying them poorly, by not training them, we can't do that. In a sense, the CEO and CEOs, when I do this, we talk about this idea with them in consulting projects, hate this, they kind of get it and they nod because they know they need to nod. They don't like being told that they are the ultimate support staff. They are the lowest on the food chain. They are supporting their managers who are supporting the boundary spanning employee managers who are the ones that are responsible for creating customer value, especially in a service context. So the market focus mindset for service quality and fixing problems, service recovery, is about putting those who are responsible for these data, right, at the top of the organisation. They're the ones whom we need to support. Finally, we talk about process, the third additional P. So the argument would be, what is it about um, these vari variable uh, elements of the uh, service, so variability um, changes, meaning that the service experience changes from one week to the next? Well, we can avoid that variability if we have an agreed upon process, a process that's efficient, consistent, makes sense. Equally, um, we might have, uh, you know, the problem of uh, inseparability. We might have some processes like recording lectures on Lectopia, which give opportunities for reading or reviewing the lecture elsewhere. Um, when it comes to uh, perishability, we might have some processes by which we can attract a last minute demand to fill seats on our plane. The, pro the service process is going to be particularly key in dealing with some of these problems that services marketers face. So this is the flow of activities, the way we go about pricing, the way we go about delivering um, the service itself. These things ultimately create um, a lot more certainty uh, consistency, reliability, responsiveness in the service we provide. One way of doing that is to look at what we call a service blueprint. We can layer <coughs> the steps in the process, starting with the physical evidence and the actions that the customers take, and what those actions or how they're responded to by what we call on stage, on stage um, customer service behaviours. As you can see, this is like this pyramid. Right? We're putting these guys up the top. But we know that the ability of this service provider to do anything easy 
or was rather flexible or adaptable for a customer depends on the extent to which they have support from others who are behind the scenes. Am I enabled to do that? Do I have the support of my manager? Are there support processes? These are payment mechanisms or re refund rules or requirements and so on. Can I invoke these processes to help me deliver value up here? And by blueprinting a service, looking at those steps and stages, we can get a sense for how the process can be improved. <clears throat> did I tell you about, I did tell you about Royal Mail with the guys on the, in the UK that were providing refunds for people who lost mail? Tell me if I've told you that story. No? Thank you. Let me tell you to you quickly. I'm sounding like a broken record because this is actually, after all, a number of weeks we've been together. But when we worked with Royal Mail in the UK, they had customer satisfaction problems. Part of that stemmed from dissatisfaction with the refund mechanism or the claims mechanism that was in place when a piece of mail went missing. What was going missing? Well, we did a bit of research and we found out it was books, CDs. This is about 10 years ago. They were the things being bought online most. So what we said was, why we did the service blueprint, why don't we stop or do away with the process of a customer service employee having to ask for permission from a manager who has to go to a more senior person, who has to invoke, who has to fill out forms to approve the refund, send it back down the chain to the person on the boundary to say, yes, you can have a, a seven pound refund. I said, oh no, we can't do that. And we've got to follow the process. Well, why? What was happening was that customers were going in saying, you've lost some mail. Uh, they're saying, well, fill out this form. Tell us what it was. Prove to us what it was. Go away. We'll get in touch with you. You come back in and we'll have written you a check. In the meantime, we've escalated this to two or three people in the mail centre who've had to approve the, the job coming back down to us to allow us to give you seven pounds. There was about eight steps that were unnecessary. So I said, why don't we let these people sign off <clears throat> on 20 pounds per day? Oh, no, Simon. No, no, no. The, the, you, you have to understand that we employ the highest percentage of any firm in the UK of uh, recovering criminals, people just out of jail who can't get jobs. We hire them as if they wanted a pat on the back. What they were actually saying was, we can't give a criminal 20 pounds a day because he or she will just give it to his or her mates. Well, if anything happened, nothing. They didn't do that. Claims didn't increase as they expected. But what did increase? When I can give you back money as and when you ask for the refund, I can give it to you there and then. What increased? Oh, thank God. <laughs> you knew what, you had that answer about four minutes ago, didn't you? Thank God for that. <clears throat> this is just a big shoot, guys. Come on, we're all friends. That's what happened. Satisfaction increases dramatically. So, process can help deal with some of the problems of services. Now, most of you will end up working services. So the next lecture or two, we're going to touch on services. I hope will be instructive. Um, yes, there are additional problems involved in a service, but they're not intractable. We have tools at our disposal to deal with them. OK, we'll see you next week. about channels, as we've just discussed uh, today, is that <clears throat> there's, and it's more difficult with a, with a company like Bank of Melbourne, because by definition, pretty much all of their um, customer-facing routes to market will be direct and company-owned. 
So they'll not direct, rather through a retail bank branch and company owned. Very few banks have a franchise model. Some do. And you might want to explore the advantages and costs of using a franchise model in banking. The other option, of course, for Bank of Melbourne is how much they rely on their branches versus direct. Now, Commonwealth Bank is investing heavily in their, their direct channels. And the question would be, is, is that also a good strategy for Bank of Melbourne? Now, when you've got older consumers who are not very technologically savvy and so on, direct, direct market or direct channels are probably harder to, to build up, and so you need a physical presence. So my challenge would be in the assignments to think about how many stores or branches do we need, what services should they provide in store or in branch, versus what can we provide online, how do they complement what we do in the branch, and so on. That's what I mean by channel strategy. Well, what does the channel look like? What should it look like? Does that make sense? Okay. Leah, there you go. Which um, financial Jason, Okay. No, they, they, well, it's not for you to find exactly what they do, yeah. but rather to uh, make some educated assumptions about yeah. what, is, what is likely to happen with their bank, yeah. with their approach to segmentation. The segmentation model should always be focused on renewal as well. Where's the growth going to come from? Um, it should also be following the life cycle pattern of consumption we talked about in one of the early lectures, that you know, younger consumers buy less, they're price sensitive, but they will eventually move into other segments. Yeah. So a segmentation could follow the, that, that life cycle consumption approach, but it could also be segmented by um, what other you know, aspects of it are valued. So, for example, if Bank of Melbourne, and I've just, this may not be the case, but if they have a slightly younger customer base, they might be able to focus more heavily on, on youth markets, um, take the approach of educating them about online delivery, not have as, 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 as comprehensive a branch network, but make sure that they were you know, world class in their, um, in their online delivery of, of banking services. So that might be a function of, this, of the segmentation. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, the segments are the guide or your guide to how you develop products, how you price for them, how you distribute to these people. The segmentation and the consumer behaviour analysis that under underlines that is the engine room for all the other elements mm -hmm. of the four P's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I wanted to know if that type of route can pretty much infer what the, um, yeah, what the segmentation would be from the, for the company, but not... I think the there'll be a few clues online um, on, their, on their publicly available documents. There'll be a few yeah. clues in some of the press that's been written about. Um, Back in Melbourne, you'll get some, a, few, a few insights there. But look, in the absence of that information, my argument would always be to make an educated judgment yeah. and to say that they're positioned in this way, so it's likely that they're dealing with this kind of market more than others, or segment more than others. It doesn't have to be exactly what happens. I'm looking more for the connection between that idea and some of these other things. So I'm looking for the integration of the idea, not just a simple description of what the bank does. Well, that's the key, because anyone can go, uh, anybody can go, um, well, that's sort of what's Liverpool can 